Hey guys, this is Harry with Zeros Geckos. This is vlog number 15. I wanted to intro this episode, this vlog episode with uh, a quick update on my gecko room. So this is in my backyard. There's my dog, it's Rue. Rue's a demon dog. This is a simple room. It's like eight by 15, eight by 16 around there. Um, eight foot high on this side, about nine feet high on this side. Got some lights going on uh, with the auto switchers, auto dimmers, auto switchers. Um, everything is Wi-Fi controlled. I have an exhaust vent up here for when I'm cleaning. I can uh, turn this vent on so I don't smell like gecko crap the whole time. I have a little outlet on top over there. I'm gonna put a wall mounted fan to keep circulation going. So when I keep the humidity and stuff going, it won't be um, too crazy. So it can keep the mold from growing a little bit better. And yeah, it's as simple. I'm gonna have a, a window AC unit over here. It should keep the room at the right temperatures since uh, there's nothing else going on. This is just a really well insulated shack basically the gecko shack and um, i'm going to mimic what i have upstairs and do it better down here i feel like it's gonna allow me um, a lot more control with everything because upstairs is my gecko room at the moment and um, it's in the attic of my house but to keep it um, hot and humid up there uh, i'm a little bit worried because it's going to start molding the walls that attic upstairs that room wasn't made to um, hold so much humidity. It's not like a bathroom, right? But in here, I have a lot more control from the ground up. Um, it's going to be uh, painted properly, you know, almost like uh, not quite bathroom gloss, but a little bit semi-gloss so that uh, the mold doesn't seep into the walls and whatnot. And so, yeah, pretty simple layout, just a box basically. I still need to map out uh, my projects for next season how many breeders I'm going to have, what kind of pairings I'm going to do, um, how much space I'm going to use here in the gecko room, the gecko shack versus my upstairs uh, attic room. I need enough space for my hatchlings, for my grouts and my breeders. So upstairs, I think I'm going to have most of my breeders, maybe some grouts, and I'm going to try to use this room for mostly hatchlings. This is going to be mostly the hatchling room. Um, so this, these walls over here, uh, it's going to be just lined with racks, probably six quart hatchling racks. I got to source some PVC and get that dialed in. And then this wall, I may, might do hatchling racks as well as I kind of expand. So yeah, I'm pretty excited to get this going. Should be done maybe next week or maybe after Flora Fauna. So maybe by the time I come back from Flora Fauna from seeing some of you guys, um, this room will be done and I can start moving some of the stuff in. But yeah, the difficulty with this room is that my house uh, isn't on a big lot. It's like 5,000 square feet only. I don't live anywhere where there's a lot of big space. I'm in a highly residential area with a ton of traffic. And so our houses are all packed in We're like sardines over here. And so I have to make the best of the space. So this uh, is in my backyard from the ground up. Um, it's pushed up right against, uh, this right here is right against the corner of my fence. And then um, out there, you can see, out there is just my side yard and um, out towards the front, my front yard's out that way. My house is right over here. So my gecko room is up there, see that tiny window? There's an attic space up there and that's where I have a lot of my stuff currently so this space will allow me to expand a little bit so that i can um, continue to grow the operations and have enough animals to vend shows uh, do more online events and that's kind of what i've been gearing towards um, and for this year it was a little bit frustrating because you know i did the pomona show i brought 100 animals sold a few things i've been selling a few things online as well uh, providing um, as many animals as possible and then I realized that I don't have enough animals to last me the year if I keep up at that pace. 
So I'm beginning to slow down again and um, hold back a little bit. I'm holding back more breeders, uh, more animals that I've grown out, a lot more of my females, and it's not allowing me to sell. I've shared this in my other vlogs before, and that's a bit of a, a frustration for me that I'm kind of back into another lull season because I'm trying to expand um, the way that I'm trying to expand with uh, the numbers that I'm trying to pull up. But at the same time, I am excited because it's gonna allow me to make uh, and work on a lot more projects to kind of fine tune my current projects um, to bring more um, better animals and variety into my breeding groups so that um, I'm not just all extreme Harleys. Uh, that's what I have a lot of right now, but I'll try to expand a little bit. I'll have some tiger stuff. I'll have some empty back stuff. I'll have some morphs, hopefully some sables, some exantics, cappuccinos, frappuccinos, um, things like that. And so uh, I am excited to kind of get those things rolling, but it is um, a long waiting period again when I thought the season was kind of be my kind of my breakout year to be like, okay, let me sell all the stuff and um, get the momentum going and. And then uh, once I decided to kind of ramp up, then I had to just kind of slow down again. So uh, that's okay. Uh, that's part of kind of the process of growing out. Um, depending on your goals, you just really have to just hold back and wait a few seasons to build out to where you want to be. Uh, I don't imagine most people do what I'm doing and uh, because it takes so long. It takes so long, it takes a lot of patience, and I don't have that patience, and so I'm a little bit antsy, a little bit down right now, just because uh, it's going to take me another six to 12 months to, to kind of replenish my stuff, and uh, probably won't be breeding um, some of my hold out, my, my holdbacks until the beginning of next season. So um, I have to wait, basically. Until then, I'm just kind of documenting the process and I will have stuff to sell for sure. Um, it'll just be at a slower pace than what I originally anticipated for this season. Here's the outside of the gecko shack. It's not quite done yet. The contractor is working on the tiling on the roof and uh, he's gonna do a few more things on the outside, paint it, finish some of the trim up here um, and paint it so it doesn't look crazy. Um, we got to run electricity to it, but all in all, I'm pretty happy about it. It's going up quicker than I um, anticipated, and I'm thankful that my contractor was able to kind of get it in, get the job in, and get everything done as soon as possible. So right now, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find a better source of um, PVC so that I can uh, build out PVC on my own, save some money, and build out the racks over here. And then I gotta fill them up with container store six quart bins. Um, by the way, six quart bins at the container store are now at a low price. I used to buy them at two fifty a piece. Now they're down to one fifty. So that's a huge cut in cost for uh, those bins. And so if you're looking for those six quarts, uh, pick them up at container store. I don't even think that's a sale price. That's just the new price it says. But I think. By this end of the season, I would have enough to fill out uh, this entire wall uh, with um, hatchlings from this season. I think I paired about 45 to 50 maybe, um, but it's all at sporadic times. So things are just going to be trickling for a while, but I'll probably be hatching babies out even into next season. At kind of the rate and schedule that I'm pairing at, but um, if I did my calculations right, I'll have... Um, Let's see, three, it'll be 24, there'll be 24 columns with, I think maybe 16 to 18 rows up. So 24 across 16 to 18, what's the math on that? 24 times 16 is 384, but I think I can go to 24 times 18. So I think I could go up to 18 high on this wall um, and that would be a wall of hatchlings of 432 um, bins. So if uh, all the females lay as um, consistently as we hope, as I hope, then 
I should fill up those racks by next season. So it's a big jump in production from my past two seasons of breeding, but um, I have the facilities now to uh, manage and create something that um, I wasn't able to before. So, so I know most people, most new breeders aren't going to get to these numbers, but if you do want to get there, I think uh, there are ways to go about that. There are um, things you can do. And even if you don't build out a gecko shack, you can maximize the efficiency of your space in whatever room that you have the geckos in. And I'm sure you guys are already trying to figure that out because you know how it is. We all start with two geckos, becomes a dozen, becomes um, a couple dozen. And then we try to fit our geckos in every corner and space in our house as much as possible. And we kind of go down that rabbit hole, right? Not everybody, but a good amount of you guys do that. So it's kind of cool to see us uh, expanding in the hobby and growing in the hobby. One thing that's been going on that we've been seeing a good amount of is people exiting the hobby, people um, downsizing. And this season seems to have a good amount of that within our hobby. And I used to be discouraged by that, but I'm not discouraged by that anymore. Um, simply because I have felt that before as I was ramping up, as I was trying to kind of build out and having a couple seasons um, of just not being able to sell much and trying to ramp up even more. I think I feel the burn of uh, the work it takes to take care of your animals, the investment it takes to kind of build out and buy um, a certain group of animals. So I understand that. And especially if you don't have an outlet to sell, it's very hard to sell things. Today I had a conversation with Mike at um, Heirloom Geckos and something that I admire about him, a uh, shout out to you, Mike, is that um, he doesn't, he's new, right? He's, he's, I think he got, Mike, I think you got in last season, but um, he bought a good amount of stuff, top end stuff, and he bred it last season and he's starting to hatch some things out this season, but he has a good amount of animals. I think he's at the same, close to the same numbers as I am in terms of breeding pairs and how many geckos he has. Maybe not quite that much yet, but almost there. Point is, is that he's newer and he doesn't have a platform or um, anything to kind of sell his stuff yet, right? We all can do Morph Market. We know how Morph Market is. It's kind of a cluster, right? A lot of people will ghost you. A lot of people will, um, commit to something and they back out of sales. And we've heard stories again and again of people just backing out of Morph Market. Um, there's good stuff on Morph Market. We can sell things and I've sold things on Morph Market, but um, it's not very consistent. So that's one platform. Another platform is your online DMs, but that is very hard because the reach is not very far. So even with the amount of followers I have, I have, uh, 5,500 followers or so. Um, I feel like that reach is decent, but even then it's not great, right? So um, how many people view my stories? I think it would, the average is anywhere between 300 to 500 viewers see any of my IG stories, right? That's what five, let's be generous. 500 people, that's 10%. Um, and I think um, that's okay. But imagine now if you have only a thousand followers, what's 10%? So let's say you have a thousand followers and um, 150 people see your story and your DMs. That's still not enough to sell consistently. But going back to Mike at Heirloom, he hustles because um, he, doesn't, he knows he doesn't have a platform yet, an online presence, but he has the stock, he has the animals. And what he does is he does shows. So he's booked up, I think he told me today, he booked 30 shows for next year, or was it this year? I forget, but he's doing so many shows back to back, just throughout the year he's doing shows and he's selling his stuff. He ha actually finds good success selling a lot of his um, breeders or you know some of the growths that he's not going to use, some of the things he's hatched, he's selling, and he does good numbers um, for what he's doing. And I love that hustle because that is the way to do it. Uh, and he works too. He works other full-time jobs. And so um, it's very possible to hustle and sell your animals. Um, a lot of times people back out of the hobby because they can't sell animals. 
you have to understand that it requires a lot of hustle to sell in this hobby. And we're all finding this out. So Mike is taking um, the smart road of wanting to be successful in this hobby on the next level. So he goes to all the shows, sets up. I don't even think he has a logo yet um, or a banner. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, Mike, but it's just basically kind of like uh, kind of bootleg and scrappy. And then he goes to shows and he's friendly and he engages people and he sells. He sells a good amount of stuff. And all the while he's waiting to build out his online presence, but he knows he doesn't have that yet. And so I love that hustle. There's always ways to sell. There's always ways to sell. You just, it's just a matter of how much you want to hustle, how much you want to go about um, spending in terms of your time and energy and resources with the geckos. You know, most people have full-time jobs, so they can't um, do that and they have families, right? Um, especially if you have young kids. I have young kids. I have four kids and I know how hard it is to work full-time jobs and build out a hobby business and and serve and donate our time locally to the community to help people and care for people. So I know time is very valuable uh, in our lives and we don't have a lot of it. It all comes back down to how successful you want to be in terms of the hobby. Like what are your goals? If your goal is to become a full-time breeder or to make a substantial income or to have a livable income off of geckos in this current market, then you have to hustle. Uh, you know, most people are just doing this for fun um, as a side hobby, so the hustle um, will be less. I was talking to Ralph at Cresty Spectrum, and he and I are both gearing towards wanting to be full time in the gecko hobby. And um, you know, we talk about how some people are only you know part time or just doing it as a hobby, and the hustle is definitely different. Right. When your income and your paycheck and your future goals are tied to what you want to do, it doesn't even have to be geckos, but it could be anything. But when it's tied to this hobby, because um, we're talking about this hobby, you're going to hustle. You're going to do what it takes to be as successful as possible. And short of scamming people, um, we're going to make it work. Now, we also know that people scam people in this hobby. There are probably more low-key scams in this hobby because people are hustling in a scammy way and uh, that sucks. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, they'll sell you stuff that they don't really know what it is. They don't know the pairings. They don't know how they're going to grow out and they're going to say, oh, this animal is going to be amazing and they promise it, right? I've been sold that and I got ended up with a lot of animals that didn't pan out how I wanted them to be in terms of the quality, right? Again, they're not crap animals. I'm sorry I said that on the gecko pod. Um, and these are all beautiful animals, which I am 100% in agreement with, which I 100% believe, but I'm talking about the breeder quality. Uh, that's what I talk about when I say crap animals, but I won't use that term. Some of these grow outs didn't pan out to be breeder quality. They're more mid, low, wholesale quality animals that I'm not going to breed because I want to elevate the quality of the geckos within this hobby. So I'm not going to churn out geckos just to churn out geckos. I know I said I'm going to have a bunch of geckos in this room, but I'm not cranking out random stuff. Like I'm trying to make really good stuff. And like I said before, yes, we're going to make mid tier, low tier stuff, even from our best breeders, but I'm going to work on continually elevating the quality of the stock of my animals. Uh, what else we got to talk about? What I wanted to talk about as well was kind of recapping last uh, last week's episode on the gecko pod where AJ and I were just chatting about uh, the gecko market, kind of how um, a lot of people are buying up sables and cappuccinos and fraps from Korea. There's been a lot of importing um, into the U.S. because the prices on from because the prices from Korea are much cheaper than anything you would buy here in general, right? And so people have been going and buying stuff from Korea and importing it here. And, you know, we noticed that a lot of the qualities of the, of the sables are a little bit lower expression um, and not as nice as some of the stuff that, um, that are more expensive. And I think that's okay to buy those things. And also because like we, there just aren't a lot of high quality sables um, that are affordable at the moment, right? Everything is crazy expensive. You still have to spend 
3K upwards to 5K and up to get some higher expression uh, cappuccinos and sables. And uh, most people are just buying the cheaper ones, anywhere from 500 bucks to 1500 bucks. That is the average price that people are paying for, for the current market of sables. Um, and you know when you see them, they are lower expression. They're not always easy to tell that they're um, amazing sables, right? And actually the sable and caption are so close when it comes to um, the expression of it at a lower quality. When both are expressed, have low expression, they actually look somewhat similar to me. Um, maybe you're good at telling, but um, I can't tell that great uh, the difference when they're low expression like that. And so I think that it's important um, to, as you use those things to pair your sables, your caps to high quality um, pairs. Don't pair it to just random stuff just because you have that gene, you have the morph, which a lot of people do, right? They're just cranking out morphs so that they call it the gene and they're selling at the tables at the shows, right? And you're seeing $200 caps, $150 caps, and they're just really low quality. I wouldn't even be able to tell. They just look like um, wholesale animals. So the point of us talking about that was so that less people do that. Don't just pair your your morph to any random stuff just, just to have more stuff to sell. Right? Think about the quality and the level at what you're trying to breed and trying to make. But yeah, it's true that uh, the exantic market, the sable market, the morph market, um, market of the morphs have come down and the prices in general have been down but I've also seen a lot of things, high quality things still selling really well. There is still a market for the high quality and um, the mid and low stuff will sell because now at those levels, we're getting stuff that's much nicer because it's trickling down, right? And the prices are cut, getting cut. Lily whites are like 200 bucks now, 300 bucks, some even cheaper. For me, I'm still trying to pick up things that are nicer so that I can elevate my stuff and continually be on top of um, quality. It's very easy and it's very tempting to buy things that are cheaper just because of the morph. And I would say um, for new breeders, just slow down, save your money and wait for something better if possible, right? I understand the itch to buy the gene. I don't have a sable yet, by the way. I just got caps a few months ago and um, I'm making sure I have good quality ones. Well, as, as best quality as possible at least. And so I'm not going to buy a Sable just because I see one for $500. Like I'm, I'm holding out, holding out for something better. And what's cool that by the time I'm ready to buy a Sable, I'm casually looking for a Sable male. I believe that in six months time, I'll be able to buy a almost ready to breed male that's higher quality for the same price that a lot of new breeders are buying their tiny baby sables at a lower quality. So there's always that chase. You know, we all want to be at the forefront of stuff. I do myself, but the sable market for me has already passed in terms of the peak. And so now I'm just getting the gene in hopes that I can work it into my projects. Um, thinking long term rather than the quick money grab of sables or the morphs. Even for lily whites, I'm, I still love lily whites. I'm probably going to collect a few more lily whites and try to have a project of lily whites to work on because they're so beautiful and you can just make them even nicer with more white. Um, we've seen lily whites that are completely covered and that's pretty crazy. Uh, it's just a blank slate at that point, but I want to work on different things within the lily white to have really high expression, but also um, a certain pattern that I eventually want to work at. So that recap was good. AJ and I were chatting. We weren't sure what we wanted to do, but um, it's always good to kind of catch up with people. We've already been saying all these things for many episodes already, but to just kind of sit down and kind of uh, hash it out like that, I think is probably helpful for a lot of new breeders. Another thing I wanted to touch on is um, sticking out your projects. So in this hobby, you'll come to realize the longer you're in this, the longer it takes to create projects. So this is why a lot of people will buy wholesale packs and they'll grow them out a little bit and then flip them and sell them. Again, I don't have issues with that. Some people do, I don't. 
I feel like a lot of people actually do that. I think it's fine as long as you're not shady with kind of where you got the stuff, you know? Um, most people don't even ask at shows, which is fine. You're just selling non-lineage animals at shows and that's totally fine. People will buy them as pet quality or whatever. I understand the temptation to buy wholesale to kind of build your collection off of that because it takes so long to make your own stuff. You guys know that I've purchased uh, all my animals individually. I didn't wholesale buy anything. I bought all my animals one by one, right? Uh, and obviously I bought some in like three pack of uh, a lily white, but um, it's not like I was wholesale packing things, right? I chose every single animal that I'm, I was going to buy and I said, okay, I want that one. I want this one, I want that one. And I paid um, prices, individual prices, you know, group prices, dis group discounts for these. But uh, in general, I, I haven't bought any wholesale packs. And now that I'm kind of uh, in my third season of breeding and um, looking into my fourth season and fifth season and seeing all the stuff that I've hatched and I'm growing out, uh, I realize more and more why so many people just buy wholesale. Uh, it's because projects take so long. Um, the one, the, my project, you guys know is, my main project is the high white stuff, the high coverage. Um, with as white as possible. And that I feel like is a pretty hard project to jump into because it takes so long to refine that white. And so when people ask me for some high white stuff, then I have to kind of remind them that most of the stuff right now is high coverage. I have high coverage down, but the degree of white that people are looking for, uh, new breeders need to understand that that takes a very long time to develop and grow even within your own collection. So I have breeders that are white and I'm pairing them together and not all of them come out like as white as you think they're going to be. Most of them are cream, right? So there's varying degrees of whiteness throughout kind of uh, the babies and the hatchlings. And as they grow out, they get a little bit more white, um, more white spotting pops out, the snow flaking pops out, but it's not as white as you think it'll be. So this is why I think it's important for me to share with you guys that Projects take a long time. Um, Dalmatians maybe take a little less time. It's still hard to do because you want a clean base and as many spots as possible, but uh, it doesn't take as much work to create top Dalmatians as it does high white stuff. Even dark projects, if you work on the dark stuff, a lot of stuff um, lightens out, they brown out. The dark, dark contrast uh, is usually only for the first um, year or two and then they lighten out they start to fade so when you um, produce babies and whatnot they're really dark at first and then they might get darker they might get lighter uh, in my experience with kind of the few dark animals that i have they definitely get lighter quicker than you like them to you know so uh, for new breeders um, you have to understand that a lot of things that we see and presented in pictures they're very contrasty and bright colors or um, things that we were like, I want that. Uh, it's not that easy to get. Um, you can get some really bright orange Halloweens. You get them and they're like, oh, okay, they're okay. They grow out, okay, maybe they're amazing or maybe they're not amazing. Uh, some will be good, some won't be good. You'll be disappointed at some points. Other points you'll be like, okay, that's a keeper. It's important for new breeders to, to have the proper expectations of what they're buying what they're making. Man, I really like this room. <laughs> this room is cool. I'll probably do a bunch of my vlogs in here once this is done. And I'll just walk around and show you guys animals. I'll pull animals out and uh, show you guys as I'm cleaning. I can do that upstairs too, but usually it's more cluttered upstairs because I have all my stuff up there. Uh, space is limited. I have my uh, bins of crickets up there. I have um, all my packaging stuff and I have my plant uh, tent, so it's it's uh, a little bit messier in there than I'd like. Um, here I'm going to keep the space very clean and neat, and I got to work on storage for all my random gecko things that uh, we all need to store. But I think up here, since this this wall is nine feet and my racks aren't going to go all the way up, I think my racks are just going to go up to seven feet. So I have two feet of space up here. Um, I'll probably put like some some wire racks up here and store my stuff up there, you know. I think that'll be good. Then uh, upstairs, my upstairs 
breeder room will be less cluttered. And even up here, I think seven feet is, um, I'll still have about a foot because I think this is an eight foot wall. I'll still have about a foot. What I'm excited about this room too is that I can put my crickets in here. <laughs> when I order my crickets and you know, I have them sitting in bins, um, always escaping, uh, rather than it being in my house and seeing crickets all over my house and my kids and my wife getting um, upset that crickets are roaming the house. Uh, I'll keep it in here and it's separate from the house and uh, so no more crickets in the house. I'll be, I'm pretty excited about that. Sorry I've been busy. I haven't been, um, I probably skipped a week or two of vlogs uh, just because of this room and honestly because I've been a little bit down and out. Um, I'm getting, I have a bit of the blues. I'm going through a bit of uh, discouragement. Um, in the hobby a little bit, but just in general, you know, I think I was uh, a bit down and discouraged as, you know, sometimes we, we get in the hobby, whether we see, um, you know, toxic things or, you know, we're not progressing as fast as we want. Roo's in here. Hey. What was I saying? Oh, it's easy to get discouraged in the hobby. I get discouraged uh, more often than I like. I see a lot of people get discouraged and um, that's okay. It's normal. Part of the process of any job or any endeavor, um, any hobby, any community. So uh, we just got to encourage each other and help each other get through kind of the lull periods of um, whatever we're doing, whatever we're doing in the hobby. A lot of stuff happens, you know, life happens. Uh, gecko things happen and um, you know life isn't always easy but you know that's okay let me encourage you guys that I'm no different even though I have good friends in this hobby and a good community and I have um, a lot of exciting things to look forward to even though there's a lot of good stuff in this hobby we still get discouraged on a personal level and that's okay all we can do is plan out um, day by day, take the steps of whatever uh, it takes to just move forward, um, take care of our animals, take care of things in our lives and progress. A lot of times we want that instant gratification and it doesn't happen. So patience in this hobby is so important. I would say in this hobby, you need a ton of patience, you need humility and you need a strong work ethic. Uh, you need to be consistent and just grind and work, be humble, keep your head down and just do the work and uh, just be patient. It's not going to come as fast as you think it might. Some people got lucky and, uh, you know, they hit that COVID market, prime time COVID market, and they made off with a lot of money and that's props to them. Um, good job on that. A lot of it is luck and we are in a down season. We are in a season that is rebuilding in the hobby and things don't come easy, but uh, it's the way with anything, whatever you do, it's just a grind. And um, you know, you just can't help getting through some of those sad and discouraging times. You just, you just have to get through it. You know, it's, it's almost unavoidable. Uh, no matter what you do, you're going to be discouraged um, at times, whether it's your job, whether it's your hobbies, whether it's, your relationships or life, like nothing is a straight line of perfection and joy, you know, and uh, we know that. So I'm going through one of those moments with the hobby and the geckos and just um, not being where I want to be in the time that I've been here. And I just need to just remind myself to uh, just get through it and uh, put my head down and do the work. And hopefully the good and fruit of it will come um, later in the season, maybe next year, maybe the year after that. Uh, in the meantime, just take care of the animals, love the animals, enjoy the projects. I think a lot of it does have to do with, you know, since I'm in a full-time um, gecko mode, I get caught up in it, right? Am I selling enough? Am I, am I making enough money? And um, the business side of it takes over. And I absolutely love the hobby side. I love the animals. There's no question about that. But in order to grow and to ramp up, you know, I need to sell and move things. And uh, when I'm, you know, not making 
what I wish I was making at the moment, then, you know, I get discouraged. So that's really what it is. You know, people get discouraged in this hobby because they can't move stuff, they can't sell stuff. And that's normal, that's natural. In the meantime, you know, I'm still doing gecko pod stuff. I'm still gonna crank out these vlogs. I'm still gonna care for my animals. Um, I'm still gonna do flora fauna, that's next week. And I'm still going to be vending the Anaheim show in July. Um, I might be going to Tinley in October to help out AJ. I'm not sure yet. Um, AJ wants me to, to ride out there and help him out, but I know he has some help coming um, in October already, but maybe I'll just go out to hang out and chill. It really depends on how the season goes and you know how funds are looking. You know, if uh, I'm able to sell a few things and to cover the trip, then I'll head out there. But if it's uh, still slow, then I'll, I'll probably hang back. But for next year, I do want to plan out shows. I want to do some shows with Ralph, Cresty Spectrum, Andrew at White Tank. We're over here more on the west, west side. I'm in Cali, uh, Ralph's in Vegas, and Andrew White Tank is um, in Arizona. And so we probably want to try and vend uh, the Vegas show next year. So we'll do Pomona, we'll do Vegas, we'll do Anaheim. Um, um, I might do, oh, I might do Sacramento, the Sacramento show in September. Uh, it depends. Again, everything is dependent on how production goes, how sales go, and um, if I'm able to, you know, um, make trips and things like that. Yeah, hopefully next year I'm able to do some online stuff too, some more online stuff. Oh, yes, I do want to do, start the, uh, I, I still want to do those um, online auctions, um, but, you know, I stopped after, I forget what was it, like mid, mid-March, I stopped. Um, I took a break from the auctions. Part of it was that I was discouraged. Uh, I know I should have just kept moving and kept the momentum going, but um, I think I was just uh, kind of discouraged by what I was doing. The auction thing is still an awesome thing. I think it can be used well, um, but I think especially once I have more animals, I didn't want to dump every single animal for a hundred bucks or less. Um, I might as well do that at shows, you know, I can do that at shows and avoid all the shipping, um, all the shipping hassle. Oh, as for the auction, my online auction on my website, I'll get back on it. I know I keep saying that, but I will get back on it. No real excuses, you know, I've just been kind of down and out and discouraged and, you know, working on this thing. Um, but yeah, there's going to be a lot more spend that I have to save up for, for, um, you know, breeder bins, for racks, hatchling, t hatchling bins as well. I just need to move things. I need to um, get a better stream of income going. Since I don't have that fully established yet, um, partly because I just don't want to dump animals for um, under $100 yet, <laughs> I could do that at shows, but I don't want to do that yet. Um, that's why I've been kind of slowing down on the auctions. Also, because Morph Market auctions is in full effect and everybody is doing that as well, it's starting to become more saturated, so so prices, so people are used to the prices now and people are bidding lower and lower on animals. I've seen people post up animals, nicer animals on auction, uh, which they value at much higher and then it doesn't even hit like half the price they want. And so, you know, people will like get their friends to bid on it <laughs> and so they don't sell it, right? And uh, I've seen that. Um, and I'm not hating on that, but it just goes to show that the auctions are a little bit saturated when it comes to online. I think there's a better way to do it, but I will uh, jump back on that. Let me upload this video and at the same time post uh, an auction animal. I think maybe I can kind of jumpstart that back up, but I'm ramping up for Flora Fauna. I have my plane tickets, my rental car. Um, I'm bringing, I'm sharing a table with Chad at Kaimana Geckos and I'll, I think we're gonna be try to bring around maybe 30 geckos each. I have a few holdbacks that um, I may or may not bring. I'm not sure yet. But since I'm holding so many things back for next season, I'm not gonna have a ton of stuff that I wish I could sell, but I'm not. But I'll see what I have. All right, but let me go upstairs. Let me show you some eggs and 
I'll show you a few animals and uh, we'll close out this vlog. Okay, so here are some of my eggs that I have for the season so far. They're all looking pretty good. I have a couple of gar gigs right here. I only have two gar gigs this season. They're pretty inconsistent in terms of its laying. Um, I'm new to gargs, but that's all I have for now. Um, some of them are bigger than others. Some have been brewing since January. So some should be hatching pretty soon. Some already hatched, and I'll show you guys those babies in a little bit. This is a Yuri egg. I'm new to Yuri's as well. This is my first season breeding Yuri's. I only have one egg so far. Uh, but you can tell that this one is wrapped, right? This one is wrapped in a damp towel, and it's because it had a dent. Um, sometimes you'll, you'll get an egg that's kind of indented a little bit, but if you wrap it in a paper towel and you mist it so that it is damp, then it will um, help fix some of that dentage. This was dented before, and now it's, uh, now it's normal. Pretty cool, right? So now I could take out this damp paper and just nestle it back in right there. Okay, these two, these two eggs are duds. I kept these so that I can show you guys in this video um, what duds are. Sometimes, like at this point, I can pull eggs. I can tell if it's good or not just by feeling it. So I'll pull eggs from the lay bin and because of the weight and how it feels, I can almost immediately tell if it's fertile or not. These are infertile. When I picked them up, they're a little bit lighter and also they're, they felt a little bit thinner. Uh, I don't know how to explain it, but it doesn't feel as like robust in terms of the bounciness of it. You know, not that I'm squeezing a lot, but you know, just a little bit of pressure. You could tell that it's not uh, fertile. So when that happens, what I do is I candle it. I candled all of them anyway, and I'll show you how to do that one second here. Okay, so what I do to candle is I take my phone or I take my loop and I turn it on. I'll just use my loop so that you guys can see easier and it's easier to hold. So I'll take a good egg, right? Here's a fertile egg. I'll put it here. And this one's like a, this one's a fresh egg that just laid. And you could see, right? Hold on, it didn't focus. You could see kind of that red ring, that red circle. And so that's how I know that it's fertile. So this one just laid this month. So it's not red all the way, but if I take an egg that's about to hatch, this one, I put it through. You can't even see through it because there's a gecko in there. This one laid in January. So, oh, you could see a little bit through. You could see the shape of the gecko right there. Let me show you another one. Here's one from last month. You see it's still red, it's still growing, but it hasn't blocked out all the light yet, so it's not as thick yet in terms of its growth. And then here's the infertile. This one is completely yellow, see? So it's just yellow, there's no, no red ring at all. It's very yellow. And these, once it's like this, I just toss them. I don't even save them. And then here's my Yuri egg. Yuri egg is nice and pink. So those are my eggs. It's my cigar humidor that you guys have heard about if you guys follow me. And I set it to 72 degrees. And that helps me to hatch things at about 90 to 100 days, sometimes 110 days. So basically between 900 to maybe 110 days. So just stuff them in here. Tackle boxes, it's the one that, this uh, incubator that I have is only seven inches wide. And so it's a little bit stuck, even for these smaller tackle boxes um, that are seven inches, they, the hinges stick out so it makes it tight. Um, but I have a store close to me called Daiso. It's like this Japanese market. Uh, it fits perfectly. It's about six and three quarters inches and um, it fits, uh, slides in and out perfectly without having to kind of squish it. So 
I'll eventually replace my other ones with the Daiso ones so that I can just easily throw them on top of each other. And here I have my Govi thermometer to make sure all this safe and well in case this fails, it'll alert me and I can run up and make sure my eggs don't get cooked or uh, frozen. This is also a thermometer probe that goes to a secondary unit that will shut off uh, this incubator if anything does happen. So I have a couple of fail safes to make sure that my eggs are safe. 72. Okay, here are a couple of babies that have hatched already. I don't know how well you guys can see this, but the lighting's the lighting in this box isn't great. You know, I realized that the light box in terms of video and pictures and phone pictures and camera pics don't look the best. You definitely need a nicer camera in order to kind of adjust for those things uh, to make it nice and steady, you know? Everything that has an auto adjust in terms of your phone or um, cam um, or other secondary camera, like it, it doesn't pick up how it looks like exactly, but it's okay. Uh, so this is a baby from Ghost and Finch. Two babies that hatched recently from Hyperion and Cali. When they're babies, they don't look like much. Sometimes they look amazing, but a lot of times they just look like, you know, normal, darkish uh, animals that don't have a lot of pattern, but it really develops as they grow. Um, so it's hard to tell right out of the egg. If you can tell right out of the egg that it's going to be amazing, then you have something special probably. But most things that uh, that pop out of the egg doesn't look amazing, but takes some time to really develop and then they become amazing. So I love progression pictures because you can really tell. So anyway, when um, the eggs hatch, usually one hatches first and then the other will hatch shortly after because of whatever. They just kind of vibe and they feel each other out. Uh, so within a day or two, they'll hatch close to each other. And then um, I put them in a deli cup for maybe about two or three days so that they can get that first shed out. And then I'll put them in my hatch rack in the six quart bin. Here is another, another set of babies that hatch. This is a, from Ghost and a girl from Northern Geckos. Yep, again, they don't look amazing right out of the egg. This one actually has really good, we already have a lot of good um, white coverage down here. And you could see the, the white that kind of pops out. I can't even tell if you can see from this video. But you can kind of see that there's like some white spotting um, within the base, you know, the dark base right under the lats. You can kind of see that. Uh, that's a snowflake, right? That's the white spot that kind of blooms and grows and creates a lot of that coverage. So, so the ghost baby that I have, when it was born, it was it looked like some random, nothing special, and uh, it didn't even look like it had a lot of white spotting. And then it developed and just kind of exploded with white and coverage. A couple more that hatched. I put the clutch in the same six core bin initially until they hit about five to six grams, and then I'll split them up. So here's another baby. And there's one back there. One way in the back over there. All right, time to land a plane. So this upcoming week is flora fauna. I hope to record and document some of that process as I pack up animals, as I ship animals over to New York. And I'm going to be traveling on Wednesday, no, sorry, I'm leaving on Thursday during the day and getting to New York um, around 10 p.m. Uh, at nighttime, East Coast. I'm going to spend the night with Brian, who's geckos, and then we're going to drive over to Wyndham, New York, uh, three hours away or so from Brian, um, up north. Get there Friday noontime or so, pack up our animals, set up our tables, clean everything up, and I think the VIP preview starts from uh, three o'clock and goes to six o'clock I believe so we'll see who shows up uh, last year Friday was a bit lighter there wasn't a ton of people a ton of VIP that came 
um, on Friday, but it was still good to hang out and chat with people. So I'm going to pack up my stuff this week and um, I'll bring a few things, uh, hopefully sell a few things to, you know, cover the trip costs and the shipping costs of animals over to New York and back. Um, and I'm excited to see everybody, though. If you're going to Flora Fauna, uh, DM me, message me. We'll connect. I know a bunch of you guys are already. If I haven't talked to you about it yet, uh, we can definitely connect and chat because uh, hopefully we'll have more time, more downtime together in the evenings, whether it's, you know, the parties or whatever that's going to happen during the weekend. So I'm excited to see you guys, and I'll catch you guys on the next vlog.